geographies of the world's knowledge. I am here with my dear colleague Mark Graham. I'm going to tell you, we are going to tell you two stories tonight. The first story. The first story is a story about the academia and about science. Hundreds of years ago, when people started to think rationally about what surrounds them, to make sense of it, they began to formulate what we today call theories, theories surrounding them. So when I make certain observations, I come up with a theory of why this is happening and whether or not it will happen again. Theories are wonderful, a wonderful starting point. But theories can only go so far. If you have the theory that the world, the Earth, is the center of the universe and the sun revolves around the Earth, then that theory might be beautiful, but it is still wrong. It is wrong because it does not conform to what we, or inaccurate, because it does not conform to what we call the empirical truth that surrounds us. So over time, scientists have engaged in what we today call an empirical method. They try to use theory and apply it to a problem. Let me give you an example. In the early days, of July 1885, a nine-year-old boy by the name of Josef Meister was badly mauled by a dog that had rab rabies. The parents, shocked and fearing that the little boy would die a terrible death, went to a scientist who had a theory about how to cure rabies. But then it was him who had to apply the theory to practice. And apply he did by injecting little boy Josef Meister with what he called a vaccine. Josef Meister survived. And it was not the end of the fame for the scientist called Louis Pasteur, who we today cherish as the inventor of modern vaccination. But it was theory applied to a practical problem using the empirical method. But what did, what did Louis Pasteur know after this? after the survival of Josef Meister, the little nine-year-old boy. Not much, it turns out. Because it turns out that 85% of the kids that are being mauled by dogs that have rabies never contract rabies. And so after Josef Meister was cured, Louis Pasteur had one observation and one observation only. And that is the fundamental challenge with the empirical method. I gave you an example of, from medicine. We at the Oxford Internet Institute don't look at medical problems. We look at societal problems. We are social scientists at heart, and we want to understand the dynamics within our society. That is a relatively new field when you bring in empirics, the empirical method. Only 100 years ago, here in London, the London School of Economics was founded on that principle. And in New York, of course, only slightly later, the new school of social research. It was an empirical method that drove the understanding, the research of social science. But the Empirical method has, as I, as I showed and tried to explain, a fundamental genetic error. 
It is based on the idea of pars pro toto, of looking at one or two or three observations or 10 observations and then judging what the rest of society might think. You do this, modern uh, scientists, social scientists do this through two ways. They either do surveys, they ask a thousand people and then try to conject what the entire society might do, or they do experiments mostly with poor 19-year-old undergraduate students who can't resist and therefore are put uh, through uh, batches of experiments and we watch how they behave and then we try to project how the financial markets might behave. That is somewhat problematic and so some of the problems of our empirical methods over the last couple of years in understanding the financial market stem from the fact that we only had a relatively small sample through surveys or through um, experiments. Today this is all changing. We are at the cusp of a deep and fundamental revolution in social sciences. That revolution is deeper than anything we've seen in the last 100 years in the social sciences. And it is all about data. In fact, it is all about big data. We don't need to look at samples anymore. We don't need to subject undergraduate students to experiments. We can look at the world as it is. Because we can get the data of all the interactions, all the communications, all the transactions that are going on and look at the world as it is, almost in real time. This will help us understand how people interact, how people behave, why they behave a certain way. Today we are here, Mark and I are here, because we at the Oxford Internet Institute do big data social science. And we're extremely excited about this. We couldn't be more excited. And when I had the great pleasure of meeting Corinne um, in spring of this year, we saw eye to eye and said, let's take this ability to look at big data and to try and understand through specific snapshots how the knowledge of the world is distributed. Who has it? Who is contributing to it? But most importantly, what does it say about the world? So what we present today, and that's my second story, are geographies of the world's knowledge. Ten snapshots, not more than that, but hopefully not less, of the knowledge in the world. And with that, I'd like to pass on the baton to my colleague, Mark Graham, that will introduce you to the first subplot of this emerging narrative. 